Tell us about the IQ. I just did an IQ test recently and did pretty well, but I was pretty focused. Welcome back to What You'll Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. We just interviewed an absolute bloody legend. Jay Papazan. Yep, big papa. Better known as? Papa Joe. <laughs> <laughs> to some. <laughs> but yeah, Jay Papazan, author of The One Thing, which is a book we did all about productivity, all about finding one thing to do. There's a lot of things you could do, but you need to find that one thing that you should do. Mate, after speaking to him and reading the book, and especially speaking to him, I absolutely love the concept so much more now. <laughs> I think this shit's amazing. <laughs> Mate, I agree. Uh, I always did. And mate, the uh, it accidentally slipped up, man. I've been sitting on it for four months. I haven't said anything. But yeah, I what? did an IQ test recently and did okay. <laughs> <laughs> mate, <laughs> yeah. Keep an ear out for that one. The listeners have probably heard about it plenty of times now. Mate, I don't know. I've kept it a secret. I haven't, I haven't flaunted it. Yeah. But yeah, no, I did well. Genius. Um, mate, more yeah, about Jay. Jay. What do we speak about? Uh, so we spoke about uh, how that you know multitasking is a lie. We dived a bit deeper into that. And he talked about how for the employee, you know, it might not be feasible to set aside from 8 p.m. till mid uh, 8 a.m. till midday every single day four hours uninterrupted mm. but he says that how can an employee do it there's a few tips that he gives and a few and mate loved it absolutely and of course we went big on analogies uh, yeah we did heaps of analogies mate it's i love them yeah i love love jay yeah big Ooh. papa yeah <laughs> yeah big papa all right <laughs> That was almost a glass match. Oh, fuck. Uh, we want to start with a couple of lies. So we sort of did our review of the, the best stuff in the book. And one of the lies we want to go into is multitasking. People think that if, if they can do two, three, four things at once, then they're saving time and they can use that for something else later and they're going to get everything done quicker. That's a full lie, isn't it, Jay? It really is. And um, I can just say Adam, right? For yeah, that's letter, it. Question. <laughs> I just realized that. Um, I don't have to multitask in names at all. <laughs> just the one name, Jay. <laughs> you know, I think it's, it's something we're all guilty of, especially today. Um, I think we've got engineers at these companies at Google, Apple, Facebook, that are getting paid a lot of money to play with our, our baser instincts and distract us all day long. So we have alerts and notifications and all of this stuff. So it's totally natural that people are struggling with this because I think a lot of the world doesn't want us to focus. But what actually happens when we're multitasking is we're bouncing back and forth. And if you look at the research, um, we spend a lot of time reading a lot of really boring white papers, but I think we've got a grasp on it now. Um, you're switching between tasks and there's two things that happen. One is a decision to switch and that's, that's instantaneous, you know, squirrel and your attention is there. And that's something that's biological, right? We are programmed to notice, you know, the lion creeping through the savanna grass, because if we didn't notice things happening in the background, we just wouldn't survive. The thing that also happens, the second step is you have to reorient to the new rules of the game. So if I'm writing a long email, I'm two paragraphs into it. And my son, you know, barges in to, you know, because he and my sister, his sister are fighting over the Xbox. So I have to change from the rules of writing an important email to arguing children. And if you've ever been really focused on something, you know, you maybe you're watching a movie or reading a book, uh, watching a sports game, and someone comes in the room and starts talking to you. And you know that the words are aimed at your head. There's no doubt that they're talking to you, but you're not actually processing anything. And you'll kind of shake your head and say, oh, I'm sorry, what were you saying? Have you all ever experienced that? Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. So that's as close as I can approximate to the reorientation. Your brain is switching from one set of rules to the other. And we're not normally aware of the switch or the cost. And researchers tell us that when people, like the average worker, bounces between emails and phone calls back and forth, about 28% of their day is lost to this reorientation time. And we're not even really taking that into account because it's kind of happening below the conscious level. And I always make the point, you know, I, I separate the kids. I say, it's your turn on the Xbox or they decide that for themselves. I go back to my email that I was writing just five minutes before. What do I have to do before I can read, write the third paragraph? 
you have to read the first two. And I, th I think there's a lot of switching costs that we just don't add up. And it, to me, it adds up to a lot of time and a lot of productivity lost. Mm, definitely. It's a big loss, isn't it? Thirty, you know, Almost 30% of the day on switching tasks. That's crazy. And that's for your average worker, right? Emails and phone calls is the, you know, the way they measure that. So, I mean, I could throw about 15 studies at you, you know, about the IQ cost. You, you don't do anything as well when you're multitasking. It takes you longer. Um, it dumbs down your work. Tell us about the um, IQ. I just did an IQ test recently. It did pretty well, but I was pretty focused. He's going to be too humble to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's not too humble to say. I think you got in the, in the, the Astro got in the 99.99 or yeah, something. One, 151. Yeah, 151. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. And you even sound smart. Uh, yeah, there was, a, there was a, uh, a group, I think it was the College of London, and they did a survey of three different sets of IQ tests, and they compared them. And um, there was one group of people who took an IQ test while they were focused. Um, there was one group that took an IQ test while multitasking. So they were interrupted with phone calls and emails while taking a, an IQ test. And then there was a third group um, that was high on marijuana. And I know, it's funny. And uh, that's part of the reason it made kind of the news. But the, the thing that no one surprised no one was that the people who were focused scored on average 11 IQ points higher than the other two groups. The reason there was a lot of buzz around this study was that the people who were high on marijuana on average scored six IQ points higher than the people who were multitasking. <laughs> that explains it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I had to always qualify this if I'm giving a presentation to a big group, and especially if there's young people there, it's like, that's not an argument to join the group that's high on marijuana, <laughs> right? Um, so one of the things I, we talk about, you know, the lie right before this is everything matters equally, and, and I don't know if we want to go there or not, but... Basically, one of the fundamental ideas of the book is kind of figuring out what your most important priority is, whether it be for work or your home or as a parent. And just a huge part of the battle is just identifying what the priority is. So if people do that, of all the things they have on their to-do list every day, if you know what your number one is, try not to multitask while you do that thing. Like start there. It's not, you know, don't stand in line at the movies and look at sports scores. I mean, okay, who's, what's the, the cost of multitasking when you're doing that? You're bored. But when you're doing your most important work, right, try not to multitask then. Um, I think that when people, you know, just for an hour a day get real focus, it can be kind of addictive. You're like, wow, I can actually get a lot more done. I'm getting a lot more time back. Now I can go home with less work to do after the kids go to bed. Um, you might find that you'll start, you'll stop multitasking when you're doing other things as well. Yeah, absolutely love it, Jay. So you mentioned earlier about the the office worker, and say if you are an employee, uh, one of the tough things, and if you're in an open planned office and all that, and you've always got people just like bugging you all, all day, um, I guess apart from getting really baked in your in your smoko breaks and all that, what can you <laughs> <laughs> what can you do to uh, when you really don't have the control over your time to to get the one thing, um, get the time blocked out every day to do the one thing? Um, the, the coaching we usually do is um, start with time that you can control. So um, the subtitle for the book is it's about extraordinary results. So it's not about average. So if you really just want to be average, this is probably not the conversation for you. But if you're really wanting an extraordinary career, right, you, you want it to be well above average, you will probably take a different approach. So let's just take the worst possible scenario. You're in an open office environment with very little control of your time. Um, there's two strategies. First, when you time block your one thing, right? That's just making an appointment with yourself to do it. Um, you may need to do that before office hours. I cannot tell you how many people that have been on this journey that have started setting their alarm clock a little bit earlier and they're getting a head start on everyone else. So maybe they're coming into the office just 30 minutes early. And while everybody else is still hanging out by the coffee pot, talking about what was on TV or Netflix last night, they actually sit down and they just hit it hard for like a half hour or an hour. And that little bit of focus, but if you repeat it day after day after day, can create a huge gap between them and everyone else. So first off is try to find time that you can control. And there's a lot of research that says that earlier in the day, the more likely you are to do it. There's the whole willpower issue. And frankly, 
getting to the office early or doing it before you go to the office can give you the highest odds of not allowing anyone else to interrupt you. The second strategy, and we talk about this near the end of the book, is kind of finding a bunker or building one. And this is just an area where you can go and you know you have focus. So I've talked to people who've literally found vacant meeting rooms in the basement of their building, people who go to their cars and work while at the office, um, going into courtyards, finding um, you know a, a space that's very off the beaten path, literally in hallways. I had one lady that would go into meeting rooms with a rolling suitcase. And because she knew if she made it to her desk, there would be too many distractions. So the first thing is, can you find a place that you have a higher than average chance of getting focus, right? You're not in the path of as many distractions. Then you need to make sure that you have everything you need to work. We call it store provisions. Because what you don't want to do is be in your bunker. You're jamming, right? You're writing code or doing whatever it is that you really need to do. And you're like, wow, I just need another cup of coffee. Well, inevitably, when you leave your bunker, I actually, I have an office with a door. I'm lucky. You leave the office. Someone's going to say, Jay, have you got a minute? And it's never a minute. There's actually a, a large body of research that, that if, even if it were one minute, it would take you as long as 30 minutes to recover your focus. So it's always more than a minute. Um, we call that getting sniped uh, because you've left your bunker, right? And someone just picks you off. And so the goal here is not to step out of the bunker and, you know, hold up garlic and, a, you know, a, a, a crucifix and, you know, holy water and make your teammates run away from you. You want to say yes to your teammates, but just avoid getting in their path to begin with. So stay in your bunker, have all the provisions you need. The third of the four steps is take all of the distractions out, out of it, you know, get sweep for minds. And for most of us, just take your phone and on the iPhone, you just swoop up from the bottom and there's that little half moon and it's do not disturb. And I know that they have the same feature on Android phones. So put your phone on do not disturb for this. You remember, you're just going to try to be focused for this one important time block. So it might just be 30 minutes, an hour. If you're really, really stressed, put a little voicemail that says, hey, I'll be away from my phone between 8 a.m. and 10 p.m. I'll be returning calls promptly thereafter, right? So you, you try to rid yourself of those distractions. And the number one is all of those notifications on your screen and your phone. And then the last one is you need to enlist support. Tell the people on your team, your boss, hey, between 8 and 10, I'm going to be somewhere this little off the beaten path. I won't be at my desk. And I'm going to be working on this project. And the key here is that you tell people the reason you're doing it is for them, not for you. Even with your family, if you make it all about you, people are a lot more likely to break down that wall. But you entrusted me with this, and I know our team needs me to get this done, and if I can just have like 30 minutes or an hour, um, I usually can get way ahead, and then I'll be right back. And in the beginning, that's a very uncomfortable conversation. And I've seen literally hundreds of people do this, and it takes about two weeks to train your boss and then your entire company that if they will just leave it on your desk, you'll be back at 10 and you will promptly get to it. Most of the people who want to interrupt your flow just want you to confirm that you'll actually do what they want you to do. And that disruption kills you. But if you can train them, hey, leave it on my desk and then you circle back. Hey, Adam, I got your note. I'm on it. I'll have it for you this afternoon. You're training them, right, to to allow you to stay in that time block. It takes about two weeks in my experience. Yeah, that's that's great advice. You probably and it probably is starting small, proving, showing that trust that you can and will do it. I like those that advice, especially getting in early as well, because as you say, that's when uh, no one else is there to give you those distractions. I think they're four really great tips uh, for people who want to build that up and build up that uh, control over their time to do their one thing. What I wanted to uh, ask about next was, you know, project selection around there's so yeah. many things we could be doing. You know, we look at someone like Elon Musk and we think, oh, he's got these four massive companies. He's doing so much uh, in the world. Oh, I want to be like Elon and do everything at once. But how can we actually go about selecting which project to focus on first? And maybe perhaps, uh, I don't know how much you know about Elon Musk, but how, how, does he, uh, how do you think he went about getting these four mega things? Because I'm sure he just didn't do them all at once every single day. And still doesn't. Um, my understanding of Elon's story is that 
he did his one thing before any of those things. And it, wasn't it called uh, like PayPal? Was that right? Was it <laughs> yeah, eBay or pretty... PayPal or both? Yeah, uh, PayPal, yeah. Okay, so he did one thing for a while, made a fortune and built a lot of credibility that's allowed him to spend that fortune and credibility on four ventures that are yet to be profitable. And I believe in the guy. Like I actually think he's maybe our best shot at getting to Mars and electric car. I am rooting for him. But he hasn't proven that he can do all four of those things yet and build the tunneling machine. Love the vision. We'll see how it goes. Can he be uh, Richard Branson on execution? I don't know. Uh, but I'm rooting for him. I really am. I'm a fan. So that said, you know, you sometimes have to look under the hood to find the one thing story in there. Yeah, nice. Usually, what, well, go so, ahead. And what about the uh, the everyday Joe Blow who thinks, oh, you know, I need to do this one thing for my health. I need to do this one thing for my job. I need to do this one thing to start a business on the side. I need to do this one thing for my relationships. How do we sort of go about uh, finding that number one priority and uh, really nailing down that one thing and even within each of those different areas as well? Well, um, in the American version of the book, you're talking about page 114, where it's got the seven circles that you can ask the, the question. That's the only page in the book I, I've got memorized. So that's as nerdy <laughs> as I can get. But it is one of my favorite areas. We have in the heart of the book, we call it the truth, um, is the focusing question. And if there was one thing we wanted the reader to do after reading the book would be ask the question, you know. What's the one thing I can do such that by doing it, everything else would be easier or unnecessary? And it's a mouthful, right? You could just say, what's my one thing? But you are looking for something that because you do it, there's that such by every such by doing it, everything else is easier or necessary. It's like the longest domino run, the most leveraged action you can currently take to make that thing happen. So it is a specific question. Um, it's been our experience that when people ask it, they get very close to the answer if they don't nail it. In fact, most of the people that I get to work with know the answer and feel guilty for not doing it. It's not that they don't know the answer. They're just not making time for it. And, you know, the one thing I need to do for my health is, you know, drop the cigarettes. Yeah, I just haven't been able to do it. <laughs> so a lot of us have, you know, the cigarette habit in a lot of areas of our life, a bad habit or a good habit we know we should adopt that we just haven't. The trick is you don't do all of them at once. So one of the things I have fun with, if you took that page with the seven circles, and that's, you know, what's the your one thing for your spiritual life, your physical health, your personal life, your key relationships, your job, your business, if you own one, and then your finances. So it might be six for somebody if they don't have a business or a side gig. Um, I usually will ask people just like, you have one minute, rate yourself from one to 10 in each area. How's it going? How's your spiritual life? If you objectively looked at your life, is it a one? Is it a 10? Where is it in between? And quickly rate yourselves. And what people typically will find is that they're doing pretty good in several of the areas, not so good at all in a few, and really good in a few. And I usually invite them to then pick one area to focus on. And invariably, people pick the circle with the lowest score. So if they are morally bankrupt, their spiritual life is just in the, you know, the gutter, you know, they might go there. If their health is failing, they might go there. Their relationships are struggling. They might go there. They tend to go to solve their biggest pain. That's kind of human nature. So it starts by, yes, we have all of these things that we want to do. Start with one. And you guys are, you've digested the book. I mean, you know where I'm going. If you identify the one thing, you start working on it. We know in the research that we shared in the book, it takes about 66 days to form a habit. You can kind of build a power habit in that area of your life that is going to help you make sustainable progress. And when you have that hot habit set, guess what? You can focus on the next one. So by doing them one at a time, giving it the time it needs to kind of get set and solidified before you do the next, don't divide your energy, don't divide your focus. I mean, you can build five of those habits every single year and they can be quite powerful. So I think people want a lot more, to, a lot to happen all at once. Whereas if they just did things sequentially, which is a big theme in the book, so success is sequential. You can actually get an amazing amount of things achieved in a year or in two years compared to bursting out of the gates, trying to do it all at once and then kind of falling flat after, you know, four or five months. 
Absolutely. Yeah, love that, Jay. It sounds like it's a lot of it's about playing some kind of long game, you know, and if you've got the patience, you can start lining up the dominoes and over a long time, you'll be start going toward a, a bigger goal. But for one of the issues for a lot of people might be they don't really have this big, you know, grand vision of where they want to go to in the future and what direction to line up all their dominoes to, to smack through on, on their way to some, some awesome goals. So what about the person who's just got you know no idea about their their direction and they want it they want a, an amazing life of no regret but they don't know where to start um i think it starts i'm gonna go to kind of the easy answer it's 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 simple doesn't it say it's, it's the uncomplicated answer it's simple but it's not always easy um if you don't really know um where your gifts are you don't really you're not clear at all about what direction to go in um, think of it, you know, it's kind of like you're treading water in the middle of the ocean. You know that there's an island out there, but you're afraid that by committing in any one direction, right, you're going to go the wrong direction and drown. And a lot of people play that game. They swim in circles. The truth is, if you don't ever swim in a direction, you can't eliminate it. And if you don't swim in a direction, you can never eliminate enough directions to ever find where that island is. So... The trick here is you have to make an hypothesis, right? You guess. Like young people, like how does any young person really know what their life is supposed to be about? Well, you try things. And so in the beginning, you might be a little prone to jumping tracks and trying different things while you're figuring it out. But you're looking for that pattern of I find this meaningful. I have the ability to grow skills here so I can make a difference here. Um, it's not just where you have fun, right? It's what's fulfilling. And that's a very different question. But I do think that you have to pick a direction and see how it goes. And that's the fastest way. I, you know, I wish I could say there was like a, a mountain we could all go to, climb to the top, and there's a guru waiting to tell you. There isn't. You have to try some things out. Um, if you've lived a little life, if you're not 17 years old, you know, but you're 35 and you still feel lost, you can go to the people who know you best and think back on the decisions you've made that were really important. There are usually clues that other people can see in the patterns or that you can find in those moments of truth that can really give you some clues about what's important to you. So you might go, Adam, hey, this is Adam. How old are you guys anyway? Uh, 25 for me. 27. There you go. So I'm going to go with the, pick on the 27-year-olds. I am 27, <laughs> and I'm not clear. We've known each other for a while. What do you think my gifts are? What do you think is work that I'm really meant to do? And it's crazy how people who are close to us, who work with us, often see things that we're blind to. So that's a great place if you're willing to be a little vulnerable. You know, ask your friends, your loved ones, right? And the other one is, well, let's look back. You know, I went into university and I thought I was going to do this, but I switched to do this. Why did I switch? Um, I was dating this person for five years and then we broke up and I chose to break up. Why did I do that? That was painful. So even when you're in your 20s, you've made a few big decisions in your life. See if you can identify the values, whether they were articulated or not, that drove those decisions and you either felt really good about those decisions or really bad. And those give you clues about what direction you should be pointing. So that's a lot of words. Does that make sense? That's that's fantastic. That's definitely that's definitely love that. a good place to start. It really incorporates sure. some awesome themes in other books as well. Like at the start before you find what your one thing is, you might be making a whole bunch of little bets to really you know, um, test the waters and, and find out what really suits you out there, which yeah. I really liked. Um, yep. And I mean, there's just a point where you start to eliminate things, right? You don't get to hold on to everything in your basket. Slowly, you're weeding it out and going, narrowing it, narrowing it. And then you look up. I mean, it took me about 35 years. I'd always loved books. It took me over 30 years to kind of jump the aisle from being a bookseller and an editor to actually being an author. So I consider myself part of the slow boat, you know, club. And, I, and it's turned out okay for me. Yeah, nice. <clears throat> so just as we sort of come to the end here, I know you've been uh, involved in a lot of books on, on, as you say, both sides of the aisle now. Um, but as a, as a reader, what are some of your most influential books on your career or what are some of your favorite and most recommended books? 
Wow. For both of you guys, um, I'll recommend a book that I give away to all the people in my life that are in their 20s. Um, it's called The Defining Decade by Dr. Meg J-, J. Have you heard of that? I have heard of it uh, very briefly, but haven't. Uh, it sounds awesome, though. Tell us more. There's a, she's a psychologist, and her specialty is in working with young people in the decade after college, so from 25 to 35. And a lot of people see those years, especially the first few, as um, when you talk about experimenting, um, they might, you know, go to a visa, be a barista so that they can dance and do drugs. And they call that an OK thing to do. Um, and that might be OK for them. I don't want to judge it. I'm trying to come up with a facetious example. But there's a lot of people that are neither building career or personality capital. But that first decade is when you're most likely to meet your spouse. You'll make the friends that you'll keep for the rest of your life. I think 70 percent of your wage growth happens in that decade. So there's a lot of important decisions that are about to be made. And she kind of addresses all of them. So I, I, I gave it to both my nieces. I read it. I've actually read it twice. So that's a great book for the I'm out of college and, and on the journey. Um, Stephen Pressfield's work, um, The War of Art. Have you read that? I have read The War of Art. Oh, I haven't yet. It's one of those that I just kept getting recommended. And now I keep a stack in my office. I think it's bloody powerful, isn't it? You know, it's like supposed to be for writers, but it's for entrepreneurs too. Like, how do you battle the resistance? And it just gave me language um, for some things that I, I had been experiencing for a long time. So those are the two that come off the top of my head. I mean, I'm, I say that I'm looking at stacks of them in my office yeah. because, <laughs> nice. um, but I, I usually at any given time, if I've read a book that made an impact on me, I'll go out and buy three or four copies and you know, I like to, when I have visitors in the office, I like, I don't like for them to leave empty-handed. Yeah, phenomenal. Uh, so what, what projects are you up to now, Jane? If people want to find out more about yourself, where should they go? Um, it's funny, like we went there in this interview and we don't often go into the discussion of, you know, we talk about what's your one thing for your work, like the specific, the things that we do, but the bigger question, like what's my one thing, like your purpose, which is a big part of the book, and it's also kind of the scariest and the, the least clear for a lot of people. Um, I'm working with a group of guys, our publisher and Gary. We've been mapping out uh, writing a sequel to The One Thing um, and really trying to hit that question hard. Um, right now, we're entertaining writing a fable. So I spent the last four or five months noodling on purpose and direction and reading and studying that. So that's a project I'm excited about. Um, and if people want to find out about that and everything else we're doing, I would just say go to the one thing.com. That's with the number one. So the number one thing.com. And we've got all of our resources and everything else that we're doing. We have been working on a document for a while and it's our top 50 books of all time. And it's ready. That's it. You can grab our top 50 books where we've ranked our favorite and most impactful books that we've read so far. And, you know, a bit of a spiel on each one. And you can grab a copy for yourself whilst you're in there. And it's a phenomenal document, I reckon. Most of the books we haven't uh, reviewed yet. So I reckon your reading list will be popped up by a few after reading that one. Exactly, man. We won't give away uh, too many spoilers, but there's some absolute juggernauts in that top 50, as you would expect. Yeah. Head, head to whatyouwillearn.com slash top 50. And you can download that, uh, that report of the top 50 books of all time. 2018 free. version. All free.